I have a 246 Dino. Uh, is it a Dino Ferrari or is it a Dino? It's really kind of confusing sometimes. But this would be considered a 246 GTS Dino, um, officially. Uh, the reason why the confusion is there is because Dino is a brand that Ferrari created <clears throat> in the late 60s, early 70s um, to basically sell V6 cars. They, I, I, the best way I can explain it is it's kind of like um, how Scion was to Toyota. Toyota was selling you know cars under the, the Toyota brand and they wanted to make a lower cost car and they decided to create a brand called Scion, kind of like the entry level to the Toyota brand. Um, they still used a lot of Toyota parts, uh, but the idea of it was that it, it was created to um, to like an entry level car. And Dino, I guess in the in the day, <clears throat> Ferrari wanted to create this. They they created this wonderful little V6 engine, Formula Two racing and homologation, and and they needed to make street cars to to uh, to homologate the engine that they didn't want I guess he didn't want to spoil the the Ferrari kind of like the, the the Ferrari brand because Ferrari is that in the late 60s that you know their cars were were V12s and selling a, a V6 was just probably not what they thought of as being uh, good for the brand so they created Dino Dino is not a bad brand you know Dino was named after uh, Enzo Ferrari's uh, son but what they ended up with as far as the Dino car, ended up being one of the most beautiful cars they ever built. So ironically, as much as Ferrari started out by saying, you know, we're going to create this Dino brand so it wouldn't spoil the, the heritage of, of the Ferrari brand, it ended up just creating a whole other line of cars. Because if you look at this car, this is the, the, uh, the birth of the little mid-engine cars that took Ferrari into the 70s and 80s and, and even today because every V8 car um, takes its shape and design and idea from this particular layout mid-engine light small uh, maneuverable uh, car so you know as much as uh, when it started it they didn't think it was going to be that significant but it, it certainly is and on top of that created a, 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 a car that was more expensive today as a collectible car. I mean, it started out as a cheap, you know, poor man's Ferrari, or for that matter, not even a Ferrari. It wasn't even branded Ferrari, but um, it it really uh, came into its own because today now they're they're very valuable cars. I mean, these are half million dollar cars now, which um, you know who would have thought? But uh, this one is a U.S. spec car. Um, the way we can tell is that the, the US spec car has, has square, kind of like a squared off marker, um, turn signal marker. That's the, the easy way to tell from, from a distance. Uh, a couple of little things, you know, they had the, uh, they also had the square marker lights on the, on the sides. Uh, this car has covered headlights. It, this is not original to the car. Uh, covered headlights are, are, or the plexiglass covers, or, or it was an add to this car. But um, you know, a lot of people have, have done it and, and like the, the, the covered headlights, but the, the original stock Dino didn't have it. But um, the Euro cars have a different marker light, so you, you, know, the, you can spot them from far away, whether or not it's a US spec car or whether it's a Euro car um, from just the DOT, um, you know, Department of Transit kind of uh, regulations for the state. So they had to make certain changes that was required. This is uh this car is a GTS, which means that the target top comes off. This uh this top comes off, and uh it, it's basically what they would consider a convertible. Um there's different types of people who for these cars, there's two versions. There's the GT and the GTS. Um GTs, a lot of people like them because they think that it the uh the target top kind of spoils the the profile of the car. Um, but at the same time, uh, people like the top off. So the GTSs tend to get a little bit more money than the coupes. But the coupes, um, people either like the coupes or people like the the, uh, the convertibles. It's almost like it's not like, oh, if I can't get a convertible, I'll get a, a GT. Um, a lot of people will just 
You know, they either want the GT or they want the GTS. You'll often hear this common uh, requirement on Dinos where they call them chairs and flares. So the flare part obviously is the is the uh, wheel arches and um, that's what people think. And, and I think the reason why people like the flares is because you can actually fit wider tires um, on these cars and, and okay, wider tires are always better. But I personally not really a fan of the flares. Um, the flares just kind of look um, added on. I mean, it, the, the original flare on the car is just like a regular fender flare. You know, it just has this, this little bevel look to it. But the, the chair, the actual flare, when they put it on there, it just kind of almost looks like an afterthought. They just kind of tacked on these, these arches over there. And, and um, personally, I just, I don't, not a really f fan of it. I, I think that uh, it kind of spoils the, the uh, simplicity of the line when you look down the car instead of having these flares sticking out the side. And then the other thing that they call the, the chairs is what they're talk, call, talking is the Daytona seats. So this car actually has the Daytona seats. So this is what they call chairs and flares. And it's basically, they, they use the seats that they put in the, in the Ferrari Daytona and they put them in, in, the, uh, in, in the Dino. That was an option that, that you can have. I think that the, the Dino seats are certainly um, comfortable and the Daytona seats are, are more sporty, I think, with the, with the Daytona stripes and, and uh, a, a, you know, kind of like a little bit more of a, of aggressive look to it than, than the original Dino seats. But, um, you know, that's, that's the options. The options were whether or not you had the, the Daytona seats or, and whether or not you had the flares and the fenders. And those, those were often, you know, required. So right now the, 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 the car that everybody wants or the Halo car supposedly is a 246 GTS chairs and flares. So that's, that's kind of like everything. That's like the 57 Bel Air convertible you know what everybody wants or every car has a specific type that uh, that you want like a you know a K code Mustang fastback you know uh, four speed is is uh, you know checks off all the boxes and but again that's just that's just trying to say that it it has everything but I, I don't necessarily would pay extra for a flare or or anything like that I just I just feel like the cars and themselves are are pretty cars and and um you know they're they're perfectly uh fine and wh whichever way you get them however they're optioned but the uh thing with with dinos i mean it's just when you walk around it and you look at the shape it's just really a wonderful shape i mean pina farina really did a fantastic job in in, in uh in designing this car uh, a lot of little details that are just just pretty i mean the the, the uh, wheel arches on the front look how curvaceous they are um, when you look at the intake, this is this is early on. This is where you know when you look at 308s and and all the other you know intakes. This is the start of it. That was the air intake and and cooling intake on the car. And, and when you look at what that was the the beginning of it. And then you follow this back and and uh, you look at the way this rear window is. I mean, it's just look at that that curved glass. I mean, that's just beautiful. I mean. For a production car, when you think about putting and installing a, a piece of glass like that where it's just curved. Also, um, when you look inside here, it, it, it's just it, it, it's just a design, you know, it's just a design flourish. I mean, really no other reason except for the fact that it's just, it just makes sense to, or it's just a design, you know, flourish that just adds to this car. Really, really just, you know, adds to the shape and the way it, it, it tapers off the back. and. And comes back to this cam tail, and then look at the way the 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 back of this profile on this car, the way you know, lean back, and then when you look down on it, it actually isn't flat; it, it's actually curved. So it really, really is is pretty. Like there's just not a straight line on the car; everything kind of tapers and moves back, um, and it all kind of comes together. I mean, the way this this uh, C pillar comes back and comes into a point. And then kind of disappears into the into the into the rear quarter uh, to the back of the car. Really pretty flowing lines. Um, I always feel like there's a big shift in design from Pina Farina from the uh, '60s and '70s. And and what happens is the the '60s cars tend to have this really uh, organic shape to them, and uh, <clears throat> you know look sculptural, kind of like. Um, you know, uh, maybe even the female form sculptured, sculpted into their bodies. 
And then when you start getting into the 70s where you have Daytonas and then you look at what they did in the 80s where everything starts getting angular and aggressive, um, I always feel that the Dino, one of the reasons why I really like the Dino is it seems to be the the link between between the 60s and 70s. You know, in chronological terms, it definitely is. Um, but it when you look at the curves on this car and yet there's a certain amount of aggressiveness to the to the angles and the intakes and and these these little you know uh, openings that that kind of gives it like a nostril or a snout and and um, you know the grill opening and and uh, it it really does you know start to give you a little bit more of a purposeful uh, shape and design and and look at the way the instead of having the the uh, you would see this is the connection to like the side strikes or the or the intakes the gills that you would see on a 275. GTB and then yet this one has it down back by the sail panel and the intake on the on the you know a lot of these 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 little design uh, cues kind of connect the 60s to the 70s and so the car itself is just is is aggressive but yet still very very beautiful and and kind of sexy I mean it it's it's this this wonderful shape. I'll open this up and, and we could take a little bit closer uh, at, at the uh, at a little bit of the insides. Inside the car, um, it's a pretty snug fit. It's not a big car, so you definitely feel a little snug. But the the vision of the of the um, gauges and everything are very good. You know, you can see everything. I mean, a couple little places here and there that you get blocked as far as the amp meter and and uh, and clock, but. Uh, you know, it it works really well as far as just have a full gauge package right inside of this binnacle. Uh, same thing, Dino, Dino um, horn button because this is a Dino. Uh, anytime you see any of this Ferrari stuff in these cars, it's because the owners added it. It's it never this car was never badged as a Ferrari. Um, so all these little Dino badges, people have replaced them with with prancing horses and putting all this stuff because. It just felt, I think early on, a lot of people just felt like they weren't getting much love. It's like, oh, that's not a real Ferrari. Um, and uh, so the, so a lot of these owners would put like a Ferrari badge on it just to say, hey, it's a Ferrari, you know, a Ferrari Dino. Uh, but again, you know, I think that this car has its own, you know, come to its own. I mean, it's just certainly not a, a, a you know, it's, it's you should be proud that it's a Dino. The GTS, um, like I said, comes off and the, and the top comes off. So... It, de it definitely makes the car feel a little bit more roomy. Um, and the other thing that's neat about the GTS is because they, they didn't have really room for the for uh, visors, they have these tiny little uh, shades that pull down with suction cups. And uh, that, that's how they, they got, the, that's that's the sunshade. So, you, you know, that's that's a funny little, you know, little thing that they, they had on, on the GTSs. To, uh, to open things up, there's a, a three levers on the on the sides here, right by the driver's door. Um, this one is the first one is the uh, is the uh, gas filler, so you know that pops that open. The uh, the middle one is the um, is the engine compartment, and then the final one is all the way in the back, and that's the the trunk. So already popped open the uh, the uh, the gas door, so I can push uh, push this back in, and uh, the engine compartment is right here that's already been unlatched so i can pull that up and that will that that uh shows the little v6 engine um you know this this is the 2.4 liter v6 little uh it's it's a really good high revving engine you know it likes to rev up and and um, most of its power is most of these little small these this small displacement engines just like to develop power up top so uh you know, pretty small when you think about a three two point four liters, but you know, six cylinder engine. And when you think about back in the day in the seventies when this came out, the the competition was a nine eleven. I mean, a nine eleven was basically the same thing. It was a, a two two between two two and two point four liter flat six. So the power outputs were very similar. And and uh, com competition wise, um, I think they they were kind of in the same class. Dinos were a little bit more expensive, they're a little bit more exclusive, but as far as, uh, you know, competitors of sports cars between the Germans and the Italians, that's that's kind of what, what we were looking at back in the day. Um, so the, the uh, it's it's not a hard engine to work on. The, the back 
three cylinders or back towards the firewall, but not as bad as let's say a 308 to reach back there. You know, it's it's uh, it's pretty accessible. So doing valve adjustments, even though you kind of have to lean against it and get to it, and and obviously this this uh, the, the front engines or the the rearmost three cylinders are a lot more accessible. Uh, single distributor on the side, um, and so the distributors are over here, and um, they. They, they make um, access to, to uh, you know, the ignition system pretty easy. Uh, a lot of times, well, on Dinos, they use electronic ignition. So uh, they started to use uh, high-energy um, trends or high-energy electronic ignitions. And a lot of that is hidden on a panel inside here. Basically, it's because it was such a high-revving engine that uh, I need a little bit more power to, uh, to, for, to keep the... Uh, for the, for the ignition system. So they ended up going to uh, um, a Dinoplex um, ignition system. And uh, a lot of those systems have also been replaced with, with modern um, MSD and things like that. Uh, this car, like I said, is, a, is, an emission, is it a US car. So it has some emission switches. This one has a micro switch and a, and a um, high idle uh, setting that was set for, for you know, the, the American spec cars. The uh, micro switch was to basically create a a different um, uh, advance system or, or ignition advance during idle so that it would pass emissions and make it easier to start. But then once you got off of idle, that uh, the, the uh, micro switch would allow the car to run on a different ignition. So it's kind of like the way they would fool the, uh, fool the, uh, the emissions so that at idle, it would, it would have a decent, de decent uh, exhaust gases. This trunk is actually pretty roomy. I mean, when you think about how much um, this this uh, you can store back here, it's actually quite a bit of space. I mean, the engine um, compartment, or not the engine compartment, the front, or as these days they're calling it frunks, uh, holds the spare tires. So there's really not much room up front. But back here, there's tons of room. I mean, I think that some people you know, with mid-engine cars, the, uh, the the trunk area tends to get a little warm. Uh, so, you know, storing stuff in here, you certainly don't want to store your, uh, store, store your chocolates and stuff like that in the trunk because it certainly is going to get a little warm, but you know, lots of room for luggage. I mean, I could easily see, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not a golfer, but I guess you could put a set of golf clubs in here, but you definitely could put, uh, some weekend, uh, luggage back here <clears throat> and, and have plenty of room for that kind of stuff. I'll show you what the front looks like. The front like I said, it takes up most of the space of the spare. I mean, the spare just kind of gets all that. And, and uh, then you have a little bit of, uh, you know, electronics, a fuse panels up here and uh, access doors to get to the, uh, to the um, <clears throat> master cylinder and, and a reservoir and, and those kind of things, radiators up front. The nice thing on Dinos is I don't really have much experience with them overheating. Um, part of it is also because it's a small displacement engine, 2.4 liters, but... Um, the radiator up front seems to do fairly well. I mean, when you think about how much coolant is going on in there from, from uh, all the way from the back, there are pipes that run all the way to the front, and then you have a radiator in the front with two electric fans. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, coolant that's circulating, so it really um, takes quite a bit, I think, to, to overheat it. I, I, I just haven't had experience. I th I've had uh, cars that had trouble cooling, but that's usually because the radiator's clogged or, or you know just needed to be re record and, and uh, fill them. But these, these cars, I don't have the experience of them running hot. You know, the, the Dinos seem to, to do pretty well in traffic and, and uh, doesn't tend to get super hot because of the, the front radiator and all the piping running to the back.
ice cold, so it's gonna idle a little bit, a little low for right now, but let me go close the door and I'll sit and I'll be right back. Actually, I'm gonna shut it off because it feels like it barely wants to run. I'll be right back. All right, let's try this again. It's a little cold this morning, so getting started. So, this car starts fine, runs well. Um, the only problem I have, not it's, a, it's not a problem. What a lot of times people ask me is, you know, what should I do about a choke? What should I do on these cars? I usually recommend not using a choke. It's really because of the way the cables run. Sometimes when you open the choke, it chokes off the three carburetors or however many carburetors these cars have. And then when you go to open the choke, Sometimes the levers don't work right, so that so you'll the furthest one or one of the one of the carburetor chokes will hang up. All that tuning that you did to get the carburetors to run right gets thrown off because one choke, you know, plate doesn't close all the way because of the way the lever operates, and you know that's just not worth it. You know, to me, that's my personal opinion. You'll see right now I've got my foot on the accelerator just a little bit. I'm I'm manually choking it with the accelerator pedal, so I'm at like about 1,200 RPM. If I were to let go, you can hear it's really starting to struggle to, to stay running at, you know, it's probably like 500, 400 RPM. But that's because the oil's cold, everything's kind of cold, and it's circul circulating. I mean, that's why you have a choke. A choke raises the idle a little bit, richens the mixture so that way it'll run a little bit better. But to me, my feeling is when you warm up the car, you're doing this manually. So you're just giving a little bit of temperature and you'll see the idle will slowly come up on its own just simply because right now just from running the car it's it's getting a little bit you know it's, it's warming up the oil so that's what that's what i'm doing right now what i'm going to do also is i'm going to i'm going to now that it's warmed up not warmed up but at least things are circulating i could see that there's oil pressure um water temperature obviously hasn't moved at all oil temp's going to take a little bit longer but it's just a matter of like you know slowly getting it up to temperature and it's been idling here for a few minutes and I'm gonna slowly take it off to go I just met the owner yesterday for the first time he got a chance to drive the car he really loves it you know and that's a good that's a good sign so I'm gonna take you along for a ride now and it's gonna take it nice and easy just simply because the car is cold um, it's actually a very cold morning. It's been in the shop, so it's at shop temperature. I usually keep my shop temperature in the wintertime around 62 degrees. Uh, so it's a little warmer than outside. Outside this morning is probably about 30, 35. So, but what we're going to do is just going to take it down the road. Let's get to here a little bit. The roads right now are dry. A little salt, salty and sandy, but you know when it's dry like this and cold, it's usually okay. So this car actually feels really good. I mean, it's not the strongest engine. I mean, I'm sure I've, I've felt newer built Dinos that have a, a much stronger engine, but you know, this thing has plenty, plenty to it. Um, like I said, new owner just purchased this from one of the usual suspects of selling these cars that are, uh, you know, like kind of like a, a broker, not a broker, a, a dealership, you know, European sports car dealership. Um, but it's it's fairly well known. There's probably about four of the ones that do high volume. And uh, sometimes they sell them over a trailer. Sometimes they sell them, you know, on, on the uh, market to, on their website. And uh, this, this guy, who uh, bought this car um, has been looking for a 246 GTS and this one came up and um, it was a pretty good price. He, I think he traded it. I don't know if he actually paid cash value for the car, but he, whatever the value is, I mean, obviously when you do a trade, you still need to have an idea what the value is you're trading it for. And um, he, um, you know, for the number that he basically traded for, I thought he got a pretty good price. Now. Is the car, why was the car relatively inexpensive? Um, it's got some body issues under the paint. It looks like it was painted a while ago. It was painted the original color, which is actually this red color. I don't think this is a Corsa Rosa. It's a little darker, just slightly darker. Um, you know, Corsa Rosa is a little brighter, but um, 
he uh, the it was looks like it was painted a while ago, and it the the paint is starting to or at least something's going on underneath the bodywork. What happens on these cars is remember Dinos were not you know six figure cars forever and ever. I mean they um, they uh, they were just regular regular cars, and I think back in the day it was painted relatively inexpensively, and um, they. I think they probably used filler. I mean, they had to have used filler because you could see that the filler underneath is starting to absorb a little bit of water. There might have been a little bit of corrosion and to fix the corrosion, they just basically sanded it down, put some filler on it and then painted it. It probably lasted for 10 or 15 years or whatever, depending on how it was stored. I mean, sometimes you could do the filler on a paint job and it only lasts five years. When you drive the car in regular rain or salt or any of that other stuff, it's not gonna last long. But if you do it on a vintage car where it's in a climate control garage or it's never seen rain, you know, it can go like 10, 15 years without without having those issues come back to me or to you. But what happens is um, the reason why it's done with plastic filler is because it's cheap, it's easy, you know? And what happens is, uh, you know, it doesn't last long and, and it's not done the right way. Now, doing the right way is not cheap. It's just labor. It is using skilled people that know how to make uh, metal fabrication panels. A lot of these panels are not available, so it's expensive to do. And as these cars started to get more expensive, people started doing it correctly. But a lot of these cars that come to market, who let's say the guy's owned it for 20 or 30 years, painted it cheaply, got it done really quickly, and then turned around and, um, now the prices are going up. They could just sell it. And, and, and you know, if you don't know about the bodywork and the paint looks shiny and new and you buy it and then all of a sudden you start driving it and let's say you drive it through a couple rain days or whatever or you start rallying, all of a sudden the paint starts bubbling and you basically have a decision. Do I, do I fix it? Do I, and then if I fix it, do I fix it right? Or do I butter it back up, put the filler back on and, uh, and then just, paint it and drive it and sell it again. So, and I hate to say this, you see a lot of those cars like that. You know, a car looks shiny, new, you put a paint meter on it, there's no metal underneath any of that paint. It's a uh, buyer beware. So I'm constantly asking people to do a pre-purchase inspection before they buy the car. The, the interesting thing is when this gentleman called me, he said, hey, I, I heard about you. I'd like you to work on my Dino. I just bought it. And that's what I was like, you just bought it. So who looked at it? How do you know? You know, he's, no, I, I know what I got into. Okay, we'll send it down. So it was kind of like going into this blind. Um, good and bad. It, the onus is not on me. I mean, if I didn't inspect this car, um, it was a roll of the dice by the owner. He inspected it or had somebody inspect it. They passed on it. They, I mean, they didn't pass on it. They said, yeah, go ahead and buy it. And, uh, and he bought it knowing about the body work, knowing about all this stuff, but it's also, this has 24,000 miles on the clock. So he kind of felt like, okay, well, this is worth a risk. So what he did was he went ahead and bought it. And, um, and so what happened was um, when it came to me, I said, all right, well, I'm going to look at this with, you know, you know, with an object objective eye, knowing that he already bought the car. So there's nothing we can do about this now that you bought the car. But at least I can look to tell you what it's gonna cost or what you should do immediately to make the car safe, what you should do with the car to, um, you know, what we should do with the car so that, you know, you can drive it. But also understanding that, um, you know, this bodywork is the bodywork. You know, if you either paint it or you don't, you know? And so when I, um, saw the car after I saw the bodywork. Okay, well, there's nothing I can do. I started doing the mechanical stuff. I, I didn't see anything really wrong with it. I mean, <clears throat> you know, initially when he called me, he was like, you know, it's going to need carburetor work. It's going to need um, some, uh, it's going to need some carburetor work. It's going to need a rack and pinion. And, all this. and I was like, well, I don't know. Let me be the judge of that. I mean, who told you that it needed all this stuff? So I went and uh, started driving it and I don't see anything wrong with a rack and pinion. I mean, when you look at this car, like, there's a little bit of play in it, but it's not a lot. I mean, it's not dangerous. Um, the uh, suspension is old, hasn't been restored. It probably eventually one day should be done. 
Um, and uh, but it, generally, I think it's an honest car. I mean, the only, like I said, the only downside to this is the fact that it's got, you know, it's it's got rust in the. I mean, rust in the doors or something. But um, anyway, he came out. We saw the car. We drove it together, and I said, "You tell me." I mean, I I'll show you what I think is wrong with the fenders, or I'll show you what's wrong with the steering. But you know, if you think that it needs it, but I don't think it needs it. And then driving it wise, you know, you can hear him. It's pulling fine. I mean, it's, I, like I said, it's got more power, less power than some other ones. But you know, for a original car that might not have ever been apart, it certainly makes all the right noises. It's got a little bit of rumble on the downshifts. Like I can hear it like running a little lean, which I might try to tune a little bit, but it feels pretty good. And you know, after meeting the owner, he realized, he says, look, I am gonna drive this car. I'm really not worried about what what people say as far as the, uh, you know, as far as the, the body is concerned. I feel like, you know, I'm just gonna have fun with it. And I said, well, then good for you. But you can see this thing pulls. I mean, Dino's are just so much fun. You know, they really, really, you know, just make all the right noises. do make great noise and they they handle really well you know so anyway he's really happy he was actually amazed at how well this he was he's never driven it before so it was like his first experience with it and I and I said hey listen I think it's a pretty good car and and he drove it himself and just had a great time so there's nothing better right off the bat he's loving what he's seeing so you know these cars are not cheap it's always a risk it's a roll of the dice. But at the same time, you know, it's great when you roll dice and, and uh, it comes up, it comes up what you want. So uh, like I said, it's, it's, uh, it was a good visit. So now the next step is a couple things I found. I mean, I, I fixed a couple things when I first got here. I did the, um, I, uh, there was a leak in the fuel, t you know, in the, uh, in the fuel system. So I fixed that. Uh, what else did I do? Just a couple of things. Battery cut off, put a better battery cut off. The one that was on the car was just like crappy, cheapo, didn't feel right. And then um, the other thing I found on this car is I'm shifting. You, you probably can't hear, but every time I shift, I can feel the engine moving. It's got, a, the motor mounts need to be replaced. They're kind of, the motor's kind of loose in there. But, um, you know, what, what that, that stuff is all doable, really easy. I mean, you know, and I think it feels good. I mean, the rest, let's see what else. I mean, I'm going to do the seals on the target top. It's not windy. It, it, it's actually pretty quiet in here, but the seals are original. I mean, they look like they're just, they're cracked and dry rotted. So I'm going to get some new window seals or at least the target seals. I'll take that off and re -glue them in. Um, that's on the list. Um, but it's, it's a relatively short list. I got to fix a door latch on the, on the right side. I mean, we just go through all of it, the usual stuff. And then, um, you know, and then, and then he'll come and get the car. I mean, it's February 2nd today. So we're close, you know, I'm hoping that uh, I'll get the car done in, you know, a few weeks and then uh, send it to him in the, right in the middle of our driving season. So, you know, I'm looking forward to having him pick up the car. Well, there you have it. That's the uh, quick tour of a 246 GTS. Uh, it's a nice little car. I'm looking forward to uh, getting it sorted out a little bit uh, with the new owner, and, and uh, we'll go over this car a little bit. And uh, tell me what you think. If you like Dinos or uh, if you have any stories that you'd like to share, you know, certainly put them in the comments below. And um, I'd love to hear about what you know. And also, you know, corrections. If you know anything else that I missed on a Dino or you might like to hear, let me know. And, and uh, this car will be here for a little bit. Uh, I might be able to, to shoot some stuff to, to show you some different things, but uh, uh, thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you next time.